Good morning. Good morning. All right. Looks like the 910 bus hasn't quite pulled into the station <laughs> just yet. All right. Well, we are glad to have you with us. Uh, those that are here, those that will be here in a little bit, and those that are online. Hello. Welcome. I uh, just have a few announcements to get us started this morning. If you want to look at your bulletin for that or note that. Um, Today, we have a special guest. We have two special guests, actually. Jay and Kathy uh, Penny are here to share with us. Jay's going to be bringing the word this morning, and uh, they're both going to be sharing during the Sunday school hour downstairs. Uh, so all our normal adult Sunday school classes, we are piling them all into the Fellowship Hall, encouraging you to uh, attend that and hear more about their ministry and how we can be praying for them uh, moving forward as well. Also today, we have a prayer meeting at four o'clock. We invite everybody to come on out for that again at four o'clock tonight. Uh, we'll be meeting in the fellowship hall for that. And Connie, if you could come up here, that would be wonderful. I know. I'm sorry. <laughs> so 10 years ago in September, Connie started working here. And so we just wanted to recognize that. That's for you. We wanted to celebrate that with her and just thank her for, I mean, I and Doe and other people are more, you see what we do, but you don't see as much what Connie does, but that doesn't mean that she doesn't do a ton. Uh, she does a lot. And so we appreciate that. She makes everybody else's job better and easier. I don't know how many times I come to her with this half-baked idea for something. I'm like, can you do something with this? And she's like, oh, sure. And like, whips out something amazing with it. So I appreciate that. She is great at, you know, in ministry you have to do a lot of different things, be kind of Swiss Army knife-like, and she does that great too, jumps in different ways. So we appreciate you and just want to thank you for 10 years and hopefully many more. So, all right. Thanks. <laughs> all right. Uh, please join me in prayer. Father God, we thank you so much uh, for our church family. We thank you for Connie, and we thank you for uh, all of the, the years that she has spent uh, serving our church and being such a vital part of what we do here. We thank you for her ministry, and we just pray for your blessing on her and her family. Uh, we thank you as well for this opportunity to gather together and to worship you. We pray that you would, um, you would quiet our hearts, that you would clear away the distractions of other things, that you would help us um, by your Holy Spirit to uh, come into your presence and to hear from you, to respond to you in worship, uh, and to just um, uh, soak up whatever you, it is you want to impress upon our hearts this morning. We pray that you do this for your glory. In your name we pray. Amen. Good morning, church. Thanks, Jay. Good morning, church. That's better. Let's stand as we worship. You're the only answer to the dark. the only home 
I just thank you that we can stand knowing that your name is power. Your name is glory and mighty and hope and help and love. And we are so thankful that we can stand on the promises of your word, stand on the truth of your Holy Spirit, and stand on the knowledge that you've given us that there's nothing that you can't do. And we pray that in Jesus' name. Just one word, you calm the storm that surrounds me. Just one word, the darkness has to retreat. Just one touch, I feel the presence of heaven. Just one touch, my eyes were open to see.
As Jay comes to share from God's word this morning, I just pray our hearts will be open to what he has to share for us, the power of the Holy Spirit and how it works and moves in Old Testament times and right now. Just pray that this song will be our prayer.
Hey, good morning. It is a privilege to be here. Um, the first time uh, Kathy and I uh, visited this church was in 1986, and this was the first church that we visited as we started uh, raising support as missionaries, and so um, it's always uh, special to, to be here with you. And um, am I doing the right thing so that this, yeah, is that good enough? Um, and anyways, I just want to thank you so much. Um, I don't know if you, some of you don't realize this, but your church has been supporting our ministry. Uh, it almost seems like 100 years, but it's been, uh, you know, like over 30 years. And uh, that means that you've invested heavily in us and you've invested heavily then through us in um, Quebec, which is the, uh, we live in Montreal, the second largest French speaking city in the world. And you've invested heavily in ministry in Quebec, church planting ministry especially. And um, you've been uh, investing in local churches in Quebec. And you've been investing also, um, I do some, a lot of work now in Asia, um, helping develop church planters and what we call church planting catalysts or church planting multipliers um, in Asia, in a number of countries there. So if you're interested in learning more about our ministry, you're welcome to come and join us in the Sunday School Hour. There's also a little display in the back, like it's a really poor display, but anyways, there's cards there and stuff like that, and if you want to sign up for our newsletter, you're more than welcome to do so. Um, this morning, uh, I'd like to bring a message from Zechariah chapter 4, and I noticed that um, at least from what it appears, you're already in a series in the Old Testament, so maybe this will just help uh, develop your Old Testament uh, understanding, and as a part of an introduction, um, what I'd like to do is just help you try to imagine two things at the same time. One is what was happening in Israel at a certain period of time in the, in the history of Israel. And also think about what's happening in, in the United States and in the world right now. So think about this. We're in a time for many people. And I know that, you know, you're, you live outside of the city. I live in a, in a major city. But it, for many people, this is a time of discouragement. There's, there's a number of people due to the pandemic that have just been suffering terribly. And there's people that really feel like, like you know, some people have lost financially, they've lost incredible things, right? We, we, we see businesses around us that have closed, restaurants that have closed. Um, there's people that have had huge financial losses. And, and this is true now, and this was true back in the time of Israel, at the time that Zechariah was writing. And, and there's people that lost loved ones. Um, I don't know if you realize this, but in terms of the counting of COVID, one in 500 Americans have died due to COVID. One in 750 Quebecers, where we live, have died because of COVID. Um, and, and many people have lost opportunities. There are people I know that, you know, were going to school or going to do this or that. And, and there seems to be a time right now where even as a nation, the United States and, and, and churches around the world are experiencing a sense of spiritual weakness. There's people that are no longer coming to church for a variety of reasons. Um, some people feel like they've really failed God in terms of uh, going through this period of time. And, and maybe there's even a sense of defeat. And I don't know if you feel those things, but those things in Israel at the time of Zechariah's writing were just there. They were just very much magnified. And so if we could look at uh, the next slide, um, Zechariah wrote after the fall of Jerusalem. And I don't know if you know a lot about the history of Israel, but at a certain point in time, the Israelites had been so disobedient to God. He had warned them so many times, something terrible is going to happen to you if you don't repent, if you don't change. And in the end, um, the Babylonians came and Jerusalem fell and they did a siege for over two years and then they destroyed the temple and they people, all the people were taken, almost all of them were taken away and they lived through the Babylonian exile. So they lived, most Jews were in Babylon, Babylonia, in Babylon for 70 years. And then they came back. God had foretold that they would be coming back after 70 years. And these people came back in a couple different waves, but they came back to a completely broken and devastated city. And they came back to a city in which um, the temple had, um, 
had been destroyed. And then if we go to the next slide, they, when, um, when they, the first group came back, they started rebuilding the temple and they got the foundation done. And then it, it became like an Illinois road project and there was no work that was done for 18 years. Uh, no, no, no it, somebody here might work for IDOT, I'm sorry. The, the road projects do not take 18 years in Illinois to finish. But we know that they take too long, right? And, and, and we can't even criticize because in Montreal, if you go into some of the tourist spots, some of the tourist stores where they sell trinkets and stuff, they now sell with the logo of the city of Montreal, little orange cones because we have so many construction projects in our city. So anyways, you can imagine they're, gonna, they're supposed to rebuild the temple and they build the foundation and all the work completely ends. And God raises up two prophets, Zechariah and Haggai, in 520 BC, because there's a timeline going on. God said 70 years, right? So this 70 year exile, part of it was people leaving and coming back. Part of it was the temple being destroyed and the temple being rebuilt. So God's on a timeline. He's like, we have to have this temple done. I prophesy that it'll be 70 years. And Zechariah is the themes that are in this book encouragement for a discouraged people. So if you're discouraged, you might read this book and you might go, wow, there's some real interesting things in this book. Promises concerning the temple and prophecies concerning a savior. So we'll look at these things. And now I'm going to read out of Zechariah chapter four, verses one, I think to like eight. Then the angel who was speaking with me, now Zechariah has, in a short period of time has eight different visions and we're going to look at one of the visions. Then the angel who was speaking with me returned and roused me as a man who is awakened from his sleep. He said to me, what do you see? And I said, well, I see and behold a lampstand, all of gold with its bowl on top, with seven lamps on it, with seven spouts belonging to each of the lamps which are on the top of it. Also two olive trees by it, one on the right side of the bowl and the other on the left side. And then I said to the angel who was speaking with me saying, what are these, my Lord? So the angel who was speaking with me answered and said to me, do you not know what these are? And I said, no, my Lord. Then he said to me, this is the word of the Lord to Zerubbabel. Zerubbabel was the governor saying, not by might, nor by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord of hosts. What are you, O great mountain? Before Zerubbabel, you will become a plain and he will bring forth the top stone with shouts of grace, grace to it. So this verse, many of you recognize the verse in the middle, right? Where he says, um, not by might nor by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord of hosts. But you see all this other stuff around it. And you go, what is that about? And so if we look, we're going to look at this. And there's three points I'd like to try to make this morning. One is I'm asking questions. Are you empowered by God's spirit? Are you empowered by God's spirit? Number two, are you trusting in God's great promises? And number three, are you a part of God's great project? So if we look at this, are you empowered by God's spirit? If we could move this slide up one. Um, you see this verse, not by might nor by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord of hosts. And those two words, might and power, have to do with human might or human authority or human ability. And so God says, he's saying this to all these Israelites who are discouraged and they're living through this terrible time and they're, they're wanting to rebuild their city, but they've failed at it. And maybe you feel like a failure at times and you go, man, I would just love to be able to change this or this in my life. And this is a really important verse to understand. That as a believer, God says this to every one of us. He says, not by might, not by your human might, not by your human power, but by my spirit, says the Lord of hosts. That God is saying to us, and this is really important for me, I work with church planners and I coach them and I train them. It's helping them understand that the way that God works in churches and in believers' lives is he does not want us 
to just ratchet up all of our human abilities and powers and do things the way we think that we should have them done. But he says, actually, I want you to live a different way. I want you to begin to understand that there is a source of power that you do not have, but that I will give to you. And if you don't use the source of spiritual power, you're missing out. You're missing out in a whole bunch of really important ways. So this lampstand thing, this kind of weird image that, you know, Zechariah studied the scriptures a whole bunch, and he came in and he looked at that, and he said, I don't think I know what that is. Anyways, I mean, it's a lampstand, it's a menorah, and the light is shining, right? And so the idea is that this light, that Israel would be a light to the nations, that the church would be a light to the nations, that, that those lights are lit, and they're being the source of oil, you see the two trees next to it. And so the, there's a pipe coming off the trees going right into the, the, the bowl that, that nourishes all those lamps. And the idea that there would be this perpetual light and that the trees would nourish it and it would be ongoing. And that's supposed to be Israel. Now, Israel failed in that. That's also supposed to be us as believers, right? We're supposed to be lights, light on a hillside. And many times we fail at that too, right? And there's two olive trees, one next to the other. And the thing that's really weird about the whole picture is those two olive trees. You'd say, well, what are those two olive trees? That must be like the word of God and the Holy Spirit. It ends up that the two olive trees are Joshua the priest and Zerubbabel the governor. So God says, I'm going to Empower your leaders in such a way that they will lead you. They will bring you together and you will do things that you have never done before. Now, that's really hard sometimes for us to believe because I don't know, like, you know, if you read all the stuff that's going on. But some of my heroes and people that I've read books by and things like that have fallen off the wagon spiritually. I mean, you know, my, my parents used to, uh, my dad and, and my sister used to attend Willow Creek Church and Bill Hybels. You know, like, there's not a whole lot of people going to Bill Hybels for spiritual, uh, you know, solutions and prayer and stuff like that today. And Kathy and I, when we were in ministry at one point, we were in ministry with James McDonald. And he had created this huge network of churches and that people aren't going to James McDonald for prayer anymore. And we used to support Ravi Zacharias. And his ministry, and it's like, oh, my goodness, when that happened, it was like, oh, man. Like, is there anybody left standing? Now, I guess I think I realized we should be aware of Christian celebrities and that celebrity Christians really don't go together with following the Holy Spirit and being powered by the Holy Spirit, right? And that's what those three guys have in common. So it's really amazing that God would want to empower leaders and I develop leaders, coach leaders, Kathy does the same thing and that those leaders would be filled with the Holy Spirit and that the people of God would move forward. It's almost too much to believe, isn't it? Um, but, but that's his plan. And if we go into uh, John chapter 14, we see this promise that every believer has received um, I will ask the Father, Jesus says this, and he will give you another helper that he may be with you forever. That is the spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive because it does not see him or know him, but you know him because he abides with you and will be with you. And, and the Holy Spirit is called um, a paraclete or a helper, an advocate, a friend, a counselor, depending upon different um, versions of, of the scriptures that you'll see. And in Joel Chapter 2, verse 28, there was this prophecy that was made. And Joel said, it will come about that after this, that I will pour out my spirit on all mankind. You know, these promises that God has made in the Old Testament, these have come true. And God has done this amazing work in terms of 
enabling each believer to have the Holy Spirit in their lives. What does it mean to be empowered by the Holy Spirit? And this is an issue that I deal with all the time in terms of church planners and, and leaders, trying to help them lead in a spiritually guided sense instead of trying to do it out of their flesh or out of their own abilities. What does it mean to be empowered by the Spirit? It means listening to the Holy Spirit. When Kathy and I came to Christ, we came to Christ um, through uh, and were raised as disciples, mostly through the work of the navigators. And they told us how to have quiet times every morning. And so we would get up, we'd have our Bible, and, and then we would have this read the Bible and then meditate on it and think about it, and then we would pray. And one of the things that was really interesting about how I learned about my Christian faith is they didn't teach me about listening. They taught me to pray. And they taught me how to make a list and to pray all these things. But the thing that's really funny is they never taught me to listen to what God might be wanting to say to me. Which is a really funny thing because we talk about a relationship with God. But a relationship normally, and, and wives and husbands, think about this for a second, right? It's two-way communication. And if we're in a relationship with God... I would think that we would have some two-way communication going on. Listening to the Spirit. Do you listen to the Spirit? Are you submitted to the Spirit? Do you have a sense that God wants you to do things and you listen to Him and you say, okay, Lord, if I, I really sense that this is what you want me to do. It's not necessarily what I want to do, but it's what you want me to do and I will do it. Do you feel like you're guided by the Holy Spirit? And if not, what would it look like to be guided by the Holy Spirit? What, what would it look like for you to seek the Holy Spirit's guidance for the most important decisions that you're making or the projects that you're working on? Are you ever emboldened by the Holy Spirit? Because in, the, in this passage, we had these people that were just, they were stuck. They could not get out of the rut. And the person who got them out of the rut was the Holy Spirit. Working through them and working through their leaders, they came out of the rut. So the Holy Spirit would help you to do things that you normally could not do, except for the Spirit's help. So this is a great promise, and it's, it's an opportunity for every believer to imagine what it might be like to be guided by the Holy Spirit, emboldened by the Holy Spirit, empowered by the Holy Spirit. Now, there's some people here, I'm sure, that you're thinking, man, I don't know about this Holy Spirit thing. I've heard people in some churches, they go nuts and everything like that, right? But I just want to remind you, you know, what are the fruits of the Holy Spirit? I don't know if, if, if anybody's measured, memorized this, but, you know, it's love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness. I'm hoping I'm getting them in the right order, right? Um, faithfulness and self-control. So out of those things, like how many of those things are really bad? Like none of them, right? And, and the Holy Spirit is the one who inspired the scriptures. So if you're worried about, oh my goodness, if I start listening to the Holy Spirit, I'm going to go off on this tangent. No, because he wrote the scriptures. He's not going to take you away from what the scriptures already teach. So living this relationship empowered by the Holy Spirit is this amazing adventure in which the the structure, the, the limits, the margin is created by the word of God. But then within that, he wants to empower you and direct you. So in what ways is God calling you to be empowered by the spirit? Instead of by your own efforts and wisdom. And I would just leave that as a question for you to maybe to think about later today. How does it affect your decision making? Does it affect... Do you find yourself repenting? Do you find yourself seeking forgiveness? Do you find yourself forgiving other people for the things that they have done? Are you tired of angry Americans standing up and just like going at each other? I am. And now we have angry Canadians, which I didn't think I'd ever see. But, but even in Canada, we're starting to have angry people everywhere. Man, if we could have some people led and guided by the Holy Spirit. That doesn't mean that you're a wimp and you don't ever stand up for anything, but it means the way you stand up for things is really different. And even in terms of our priorities, 
What does it mean to live as God people directed by the Holy Spirit? The next point is, are you trusting in God's great promises? So if we look, here's a picture, uh, a woodcut by Gustav Dory of them trying to, to build the temple. And you see this really weird ver verse again. What are you, O great mountain? Before Zerubbabel, you will become a plain. I mean, it's really amazing. You can imagine that, that you know, this verse is basically, if you contextualize it for today, before Pritzker, you will become a plain, you know? I mean, it's it, it, like Zerubbabel was just, he was the governor. He was, a, so, he was a, appointed by um, the, the king, the emperor, and, and he's got Israel as his, his state that he's running. And it's a completely devastated thing and everything is in disarray and the wall of Jerusalem is crumbled and there's no temple and the people are poor. And he's like, oh my goodness, I think I should have stayed in Babylon, you know. And, and here's this promise from God. You know, what is that mountain? That mountain is all the obstacles in front of the governor of ever getting this public works project of the temple, the most important thing in all of Jerusalem, how are we going to get this built? Now, if you think about what this means, I have a civil engineering degree, they had to cut block, big, huge pieces of block, right? No trucks, no tractors, they're moving it on logs, pushing it, with maybe some donkeys helping, okay? They have to cut the blocks. They have to go find trees, big, huge trees, and cut the timbers and get them back to Jerusalem without them getting stolen by all the thieves on the road. And they have to get a bunch of people who are discouraged and don't have any desire to get this project done. They have to get them all together and get them to work as a team. Now, Pastor Paul, that's a little bit like running a church, isn't it? I mean, when you sit and look at this, this amazing promise, and, and you know, Zechariah's revelations, he, he, God promised to empower Joshua and Zerubbabel, and he did. God promised that the temple would be completed, and it was. God promised to restore the nation of Israel, and it was. And if you go on beyond that, God promised Jerusalem would extend well beyond her walls and welcome people from around the world. Now, this was written five centuries before Jesus. Right? Think about this for a second. You're in this completely devastated city that doesn't even have walls or a temple, and people are just scrubbing around trying to find food. And they're saying people from around the world are going to visit this city one day. And, and the city is going to expand well beyond the walls that we're going to rebuild. Now, how in the world would they know that that's true? How would, how would Zechariah know that that's true? Because the Spirit of God spoke to him, and God promised it, and guess what? That's one of the places I want to go. That's on my bucket list, to go to Jerusalem. And there's people from all over the world that come there and stand in front of the Wailing Wall. And that's the place where the temple used to be, but the temple isn't there anymore. Exactly like Jesus said, it wouldn't be there anymore. Are you understanding something here? Like God is making these promises. And I don't know if you're like keeping score but it's like, done, 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 done. Whoa. That's a pretty good track record. That's amazing. Later on in the book of Zechariah, God promises that the Messiah will remove sin in one day. Oh, gee, I wonder which day he's talking about. I wonder how he could foresee over five centuries in the future that the Messiah would remove sin in one day. And God promised his spirit would be poured out, and it was. So the question I have for you, are you living according to the promises of God? Like in the midst of your everyday life, and you're trying to pay your bills, and you're trying to do this and get your car fixed and everything else, is there something bigger than all that? And are you understanding the promises of God and living according to them? To them because honestly I get really discouraged sometimes and that is what helps me that is what go I go back to over and over again I go how if Christianity is not true how in the world can all these things have been promised so far in advance 
and they happen, and the details on the prophecies are just amazing. And there's nobody else. Like, I've studied all the religions in the world, the major religions in the world, and there's nothing like this in any of the other religions. Christianity is exceptional. So do you believe that God is faithful? Do you trust him? If we could go to the next slide. If you have any money in your pocket, and you, you may not have any money in your pocket this morning, um, since 1956, you have this reminder in your pocket all the time. In God we trust. Now, there's not very many countries around the world that have this on their money. So if you take it out and you look at it, I mean, that's a really interesting question. Do I really believe that God is worthy of my trust? And I hope after listening to this and looking, and if you go back and look at some of the things in Zechariah's book, and it's not just Zechariah, right? It's Isaiah, and there's all these prophecies from all these different places. I think God is worthy of your trust, your complete trust. That means that you can go to him and you can say, Lord, there's a whole lot of things that are not going right in my life. There's a whole lot of things that I don't like right now. The country I used to live in isn't there anymore. Everything's changing around me. I don't know who to vote for. This thing is getting crazy. You can trust God. You can believe in him because all these people in Zechariah's time, they were looking around and they were, had enemies all around them that were trying to take them down and keep that temple from getting done. And it ended up getting done in three years. And maybe Governor Prisker would be happy about that. Like a three-year project, we got that done. That's a, that's a big win, right, for the state of Illinois. God is worthy of our trust. He makes promises, he keeps promises, and he wants you to trust him and believe in him. And the last, the last thing that I'd like to do is talk about the last question, are you part of God's great project? So at the time of Zechariah, the great project was, God says, look, you guys have to get this temple done because we're on a timeline and 70 years is going to be up soon. And I promised that this would be done in 70 years and that the people would come back and Jerusalem would be there and everything. And, uh, and it got done. It got done in spite of all the problems, all the difficulties. The temple was built. It was called the second temple. Herod later took that second temple and he expanded it and, and renovated it and made it nicer. Um, and then just as was foretold, it was destroyed by the Romans in 70 AD and it hasn't been rebuilt to this day. So where's the temple? Like what kind of temple? Yeah, awesome. The temple is you. It says in several different places in the New Testament that the church today forms a living temple. I don't know if you feel like you're living stones, part of a living temple, but that's what, that's what it says. And the other part of God's great project is this. I want to read this verse out of Zechariah chapter 12, verse 10. And I will pour out on the house of David and the inhabitants of Jerusalem a spirit of grace and supplication. They will look on me... Now, think about this for a second. They will look on me, that's God speaking, the one they have pierced. God is spirit. How do we pierce him? And they will mourn for him. Oh, gee, why would they mourn for God? Maybe he died. And as one mourns for an only child and grieve bitterly for him as one grieves for a firstborn son. Now, that is an amazing prophecy, right? Because if you look in that, it basically is the idea that God is going to come to earth. In order for him to be pierced, he has to have a human flesh, human body. And he will die. And for some reason, he's going to be associated with an only child and a firstborn son. Does this remind you of anybody? Like, what are you doing in December? Maybe you're going to celebrate Christmas. This is an amazing prophecy and today, what is God's project? God's project is helping people from every tongue and tribe and nation to come and know the one 
who took sin away in one day, the Messiah. The physical temple was completed back in the time of Zechariah. But the living temple is not completed today. You are part of the living temple. And God's project is bigger than anybody could ever have imagined. At the time of Zechariah, Zechariah could never imagine anything like this. And today, even the disciples couldn't understand it. And then slowly they began to understand it. And today we have this amazing thing before us where Christianity started out in this tiny little spot way over in the Middle East, and now it covers the entire globe in so many places. They're counting the number of tribes that still don't have a Bible in their language, and there's missionaries that are going out in all kinds of different places to lead people to Christ. And as we look forward, you see this verse out of Revelations chapter 7, verse 9. After these things I looked, and behold, a great multitude which no one could count from every nation and all the tribes, peoples, languages, standing before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed in white robes and palm branches were in their hands. And they cried out with a loud voice saying, Salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb, the Lamb who was slain, the Lamb who was that one who came, who was himself God. They looked on me, the one they had pierced, and mourned for him as one mourns for an only child or a firstborn son. So God, the Father, the Lamb, and the Holy Spirit. So as we sit and think about this, God is at work still. He's still building. He's building a living temple, and you are part of the living temple, and the local church, I don't know if you've ever thought about this, but your local church is an expression of this living temple. And so I would ask you this question. Are you a part of God's project building this local expression of his temple? What is it that God wants you to do to contribute to the ministry of this church, both inside the doors of the church and outside in the community? Because it takes both, right? You know that. That the future of the church is not in the church. The future of the church is outside the church. The future of this church is outside this church. The people that are going to make this church greater are not here this morning. They still need to be one to Christ and discipled. Are you a part of that project? What is the role that God wants you to play? And then your church has invested in missions over so long. And you have invested in all this work that's taking place around the world. And that is great. That is wonderful. And the only way that you can continue to do it is to continue to grow the local expression of this living temple so that you can continue to invest in the overseas expression and the city of Chicago expression and all these other places where God is at work through different people to build the living temple and to see all these thousands and thousands of people come to Christ. And the thing that's really amazing to me, honestly, is I have the privilege of being on the front lines of some of the places where God is working. And in India... The church is growing so quickly in so many ways. There's persecution that's happening because there's just too many people coming to Christ out of Hinduism. And, um, you know, you gave to Myanmar. And I just recently had a, through the, the uh, Vacation Bible School project, and I just recently had a conversation with the president of the Evangelical Free Church of Myanmar. And he said, you know, our country is just completely ravaged. They're, they went through a coup. The, the whole economy is in, in a shambles. Uh, they have COVID everywhere, and they have no uh, hospitals and oxygen that they can use, and people are dying everywhere. He says, there's so many people coming to Christ. It's really amazing. We haven't seen this many people come to Christ in a long time. God is at work in spite of COVID-19. God is at work trying to grow his church in so many different places. 
Are you empowered by God's Spirit? Are you trusting in God's great promises? Are you a part of God's great project? I want to encourage you to think about those three questions. And if, you, if you're saying, oh, man, I'd love to try to help this church grow in some way, I would encourage you to, to talk to one of the pastors uh, or to talk to some other leader that you know and, and try to understand, like, what am I gifted in? What are the things that I can do to contribute? I would ask you, like in your prayer meeting this afternoon, to pray for world missions. And thank you so much for the investment that you've made in, in our lives. And I know you've supported many other missionaries. And that's just wonderful. And I want to thank you for that. I encourage you to continue to do it. And you can give out support individually. You can give it through the church. But God is at work in the world in which we live. And we can really trust him. And he wants to guide us and lead us in this time of uncertainty so that we can actually do kingdom work, even if you may have to wear a mask every now and then, or you might have to go get vaccinated. I don't know what you're going to do, but God will lead you in those things. But there is kingdom work to do in this time. And he wants to help us. I hope this is an encouragement to you. And I want to pray, and um, we're going to come and have another song. Heavenly Father, we just thank you for these amazing promises. And we don't deserve any of this. I am a sinner. I deserve hell. And I just thank you that in your grace, you have forgiven me through the blood that was shed on the cross. The Messiah promised to remove sin in one day. And we just thank you, Lord. Help each of us to understand where we stand, what it is you want us to do, how we can move forward, and what does it mean to trust you in uncertain times? Help us to understand your Holy Spirit and how he wants to work in our lives, to be open to him. And help us to see the great project that you're involved in, even in the midst of COVID-19. Thank you that we can trust you and walk with you. You really do want your Holy Spirit to be present in our lives. And we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand as we close. You were the word at the beginning, one with God, the Lord most high. You hear.
I just want to invite everybody again to stick around uh, for Sunday School 1030. Jay, thank you for sharing. He's gonna, he and his wife are going to be sharing more downstairs. I invite you to stick around for that. And now may the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen.